Hey, 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 hashtag speak easy podcast listeners. I'm super excited to come to you with another episode here. Uh, listen, you guys know I always love bringing some amazing guests to you because they share the good, the bad, the ugly when it comes to entrepreneurship, starting the business, keep going, elevating the business, all of those pieces. So with that being said, I want to say hey to my guest today. Hello, Shelly. Hello, how are you today? I am doing great. Super excited to have you on as a guest today. Uh, let the studio audience know a little bit about yourself and then we'll dive into today's topic. Yeah, so I'm a wife, mother of three, entrepreneur, author, um, and mental health advocate. And I'm here today to, you know, kind of just tell my story. But, you know, my husband suffered from bipolar disorder for about nearly two decades. And, you know, we came uh, back to, we got back together. I helped save his life and eventually launched a healthcare company as a result of, you know, helping him through this struggle with mental illness. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty much my story. <laughs> now I'm looking forward to this conversation because it, it, we have a lot going on when it comes to mental health. I think now more than ever, we're having more of a, conver a public conversation about mental health. Uh, but not just that, we're starting to see that mental health is um, definitely gives us kind of the puzzle pieces for the makeup of individual people and, you know, seeing why they do things and, you know, the, the background, the history, all of those things really do make a big, you know, significant importance when we look at an individual. So with that being said, knowing that you went through a process of being separated from your husband and going back, what uh, allowed you to have that courage to go back? Because for a lot of people, that is a, a courageous step to go back to something that you walked away from. So I think the first thing is I was driven, my motivations were driven by my heart and not my ego. And I think many people are driven solely by their ego and everything is black and white, meaning right versus wrong. And the world just doesn't work that way. There's a lot of gray. And, you know, we, don't, we, only have, we all have our individual stories. So I, I think that was really the first step to understand that what I, motivates me is coming from my heart first. Second step is I really had to understand the illness and educate myself and realize, you know, what are his symptoms and understand the illness to the point where I was able to separate the disease from who he was and his personality. And I think if that is done and those two components are, are half the battle, because we're always thinking about how does this impact us? What, what does this make? How does this make me feel? But if you have that extra heart and that extra compassion to a different degree and a different level, then you're able to kind of embrace all the good in the situation and be able to help him, him, him or her recover. That's so important. Distinguishing the, the illness and the person, the individual person is so important because I think we, we, allow ourselves to be comfortable in putting a label on people sometimes because we think, oh, if we just label it, right, then, then we can just move to the side. We can move on to the next thing. If we put a step, you know, a label on it, then we can kind of bypass it. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of labels that have been placed on people that were not even true. No. And so that's really hard. So talk us through that process of what it looks like to truly have um, an understanding of the illness. So I think the first step, as I alluded to earlier, is to educate yourself. And I don't mean just, you know, searching on Google every article you can find. I also mean talking to experts and picking their brains and getting multiple opinions. Because the problem is we're either, we either go to these doctors and we see, we, we, we think they're God and they know everything. And frankly, they don't. You know, so I think one step is to understand and have the confidence that you as a caretaker, you as a loved one, you're helping this person, you understand their illness, whether it is a physical ailment or is it a mental ailment better than anybody else. And I think medicine, the fundamental problem today is they really do not look at the family members and 
uh, allow them to give you know some of the symptoms of what they're seeing and a full picture of what's going on with the patient. You know, like if somebody has cancer, they're going to have their spouse come in and see the oncologist as well, right? And that spouse is going to say, well, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that, you know, and kind of add to what the patient is saying. But we have certain, you know, levels of privacy and we feel, you know, the two should not mesh together when it comes to mental illness. So sometimes we shut out our loved ones. We shut out people that can actually help us and provide a broader perspective. And I think the other problem with that is it leads to a lot of misdiagnosis, which is even more of a difficult issue. Most definitely. And you hit on something that was a really important word. It's caretaker, because uh, we don't understand still what that, you know, the definition, the true definition of that word. Because even when we think about the vows that we take in marriage till death do us part, that means that at some point you may become a caretaker caretaker for your loved ones. You may become a caretaker for your children. And what does that really look like and feel like? Because in this process, um, you are the caretaker, but you also have to make sure that you're taking care of you as well. And so exactly. what does that look like during throughout this process? Because I know part of it, and you, and you said that with, you know, sometimes you do have to take that time and walk away, mm -hmm. be able to take better care of yourself. So what has that care taking or that self-care really looked like for you during this process? So that was an evolution. That was really a process that I had to face after my husband came back, after he sought treatment, after he, we started to rebuild the family. Then I stepped back and I realized, wait a minute, I'm still falling apart here. You know, because my husband kind of had this idea in his head that I was this superwoman mentality. And I told him repeatedly, I am not, I am just as human as you are. <laughs> you know, I may not be suffering from bipolar disorder, but I'm probably suffering some, from some post-traumatic stress. I've probably got my own set of triggers based on what happened to me, you know? So I think it, it took him a little bit of time to really understand that and grasp that. But I think as a caretaker, what we do is we shy away and we think that the person who's ill, whether they're suffering from a physical condition or a mental condition, it's they're the focus and that's it. And we don't, we forget about ourselves. And even as a mother, you know, you tend to do that because you put your children first and what they need. And so I came last, frankly, and it took me a really, really long time to say, okay, this is what I need. You know, and so one of my whole routines to self-care is meditation. So I do meditation about, you know, 45 minutes to an hour every single morning. And that's my sacred time. So, you know, nobody is welcome in the room where I'm doing that. If, if there's not an emergency, don't bother me. <laughs> I don't care if the phone is ringing off the hook and there's something going on with the company. If it's not an emergency, the kids leave me alone. And, and so you really have to put your boundaries up and it's not selfish. And I think when people are so compassionate and so giving to another human being, they're giving themselves a part of themselves to that person, but they're forgetting there's got to be a piece of themselves for them. Oh, that part. And, and, you know, definitely with the boundaries, it's always, it's interesting because when you start setting up the boundaries, it feels like you are like trying to rip your own arm off. It feels like it is so um, foreign, you know, because it's not something that you, you're used to doing. But then once you start setting up those boundaries, it becomes a habit. And I think that's one of the most valuable things that we learn over time is that setting up the boundaries does not just become a good habit for us but it also becomes a good habit for the people that we're setting them up for that are around us because they learn how to interact with people. They learn. So your husband learns, okay, yeah, she is still human. Um, mm -hmm. I, she doesn't have a cape <laughs> in the closet. So yeah. I have to approach this um, realizing that she is human and there will be times where she gets frustrated. There will be times where she's angry or, you know, where mm -hmm. she's sad and, you know, disappointed. And so, um, uh, which brings me to another point, because when we felt, think about the whole idea of being driven by the heart and not by the ego, there's, um, I think there's a piece that unfortunately, as uh, I think as humans just around the world, we miss mm -hmm. 
and that's having the right words. Oftentimes we go and we think everything is just anger, uh -huh. but it's not. Sometimes uh -uh. it's shame, sometimes it's fear and really learning how to define our feelings in the moment, uh -huh. we don't really know how to do that still. And as adults, uh -huh. we don't know. And then that means we can't teach the children how to do it either. Exactly. And I think that's what's missing in society today. A lot of mothers are forgetting mothers and fathers to really teach their children how to feel. You know, it, it is okay to have certain emotions, you know, just be more communicative with them. How did, how did the situation make you feel? You know, and so we are strong advocates in therapy, you know, even to this day, we're all doing therapy. We have therapy for my children. We, we've been in marital therapy for a long time. Um, you know, my husband's in therapy. And so I, I feel like, you know, if that stigma is kind of removed and I think more so it's, it's starting to evolve and people are starting to open up more and more to it. But that is something because it provides a neutral third party and an outlet to talk about those feelings and to get them out there and, and not really be judged, you know, versus telling you know, a loved one or a family member or a friend. You have that neutral area, that safe space. That safe space is very important. I know for me, even with my clients, that has been one of the driving forces is just making sure that we have that safe space, making sure that we're going back and we're learning the definitions of some of these words because we use words incorrectly just at on a regular basis. But going back and really defining what some of these feelings are, defining what some of these different words are, uh, even when we think about how um, different generations use different words, there can be a, a vast difference between how you speak about trauma and how a grandparent may speak about trauma. Mm -hmm. Completely different. And they may not even see what you're going through as trauma. You know, mm -hmm. someone may listen to this episode and hear you say that you may have PTSD and they're like, well, but she wasn't in a war. She wasn't this, she wasn't that. Mm -hmm. it, it's all that perception, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when we start to learn the different definitions of these, um, the different terminologies that are being uh, shared through social media, through the media, um, through everyday conversations, then it allows us to kind of say, okay, now I take off the, you know, the glasses that I had on, I can go ahead and make sure that I'm, I'm not clouding or um, causing myself to see things uh, just judgmental even, you know, when we're having these conversations. So I definitely applaud you for that because it, it, it yeah. is a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. It is a lot for sure. So now, now starting the business, how has that been for you? Um, with everything that you've taken on, do you see that as being uh, something that could potentially be uh, like a thorn in your side when you're helping other people because you're like, oh, this is a trigger. This is something that I'm like, oh, it brings me back to a space that I want to, I don't want to go to. Or do you see that as being the driving force for you to say, no, I know what it takes to get past this point and I want to see them do it. So I saw it as the opposite. You know, I saw it as a way to give back to other people in society. You know, it was really fulfilling when I helped save my husband's life. Because, I mean, if you think about it, all odds were against us. You know, 90% of marriages fail when one spouse has bipolar disorder for one. Two, he had already filed for divorce. It was highly contentious. We had lawyers involved. I mean, he was untreated. I mean, everybody said, let it go. It's never going to happen. So I proved to myself that I was strong enough and capable enough to beat the odds and not listen to all these other people that were telling me it's a lost cause. Cause I can't even tell you how many times I really heard that. And so the day that he sought treatment, I was overjoyed. However, for him, that was literally the worst day of his life because that was the deepest, darkest depression that he had ever experienced. And, you know, in that point in time, when I helped save his life and didn't turn my back against him, like so many other people did and was there and still standing, 
that meant the world to him. And, and I realized then that I had a huge impact on this person's life, whether the marriage survived or not, it didn't really matter to me at that point. It was, it was very damaged and broken at that point. So I wasn't even concerned about the marriage, but the point was I helped save him. And, you know, of course he had to do a lot of the work and a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of wanting to get better, but there was a drive and a reason for him to get better. And that was me, that was his children, that was, you know, coming back to us. And so when that happened, I mean, it was, it was just this epiphany that I have to do something in this world where, you know, I want to go into healthcare and give back to people. And so that's kind of the path that, you know, led the way. I love that. I think. Uh, Unfortunately, we have so many people that are in the um, psychotherapy industry, um, that are in the counseling industry, mm-hmm. that have, you know, they, they talk about being um, like smell death, you know, as in you're in a room for so long that you don't really smell what's really going on, but somebody coming into the room, they can smell it. And I feel like that's what's happened in our counseling and therapy industries is that a, for a lot of people, that's that's why people have not gone to counseling. That's why they won't go to a therapist. That's why there's still this big dark cloud over you know getting that um, level of help and support. And it's because you know when you go in, they haven't really transformed and gotten up to the times, but I can say this, I feel like uh, the pandemic really kind of shifted some things in the counseling industry because for them to make the big jump from doing in-person sessions to virtual sessions, I was like, that was major. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) For the people that had anxiety about going into an office, that was major for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I saw that as a huge win. But how many other places do we really like? Are we like trying to shake it up to get that win so we can make this not so much of still a um, a passe thing, still a thing of you know, oh no, only rich people go to counseling. Um, no, only people that have really messed up go to counseling. Like no, right. people, you can go to counseling for any significant thing that has happened in your life you can go to counseling just for good mental health Mm -hmm. there are so many things that come with that and we're starting to get in that path of understanding it more what would you say would be one of the ways that we can kind of be more of an advocate for you know not only going and taking that step to seek out counseling but sticking Mm -hmm. with it because I think that's the other piece of it, mm-hmm. it is staying with it. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think, you know, you it has to come from that person's heart and that person's being. Otherwise, you can't convince other people to do therapy. If they don't feel it, they're already going to go in with that idea that it's going to fail. They're going to go to one session and say, this doesn't do anything for me. I don't know why you sent me. You know what I mean? And so the first thing is patience. And, and every so many people today in this day and age with technology, with social media, everything's in our face. We have instant gratification. We have Amazon. We can order anything at you know a moment's notice, right? We have no patience for anything. And, and so you need patience for psychotherapy because it takes years. It takes a lot of time. It, it takes effort from the person that's going for the therapy as well as from, to find the right therapist, which I, is a whole other topic because finding the wrong therapist can be extremely detrimental to your mental health. Oh, most definitely. I, I love that. Speak Easy Podcast listeners, this episode is really important because we've seen so many people go through things and they feel like they're all alone. They feel like Um, nobody's going to understand, nobody's going to care, nobody's going to want to listen. But the reality is, is um, that's holding you in the position you're in. Uh, It's not necessarily the truth. There's always somebody that wants to hear um, what it is that, you know, is going on with you that can help. Mm -hmm. And I I, I love that you said that earlier on in the episode is sometimes it's not the good girlfriend, the good guy friend. Sometimes it's not um, 
it, it, it's not a mentor, it's not a coach. Sometimes it's taking it a little step further to someone who has an unbiased opinion. And that's very important uh, as we move forward. And so when we think about starting a business, that listen, your mental health is important. I've, I've literally have seen far too many business owners who have committed suicide, business owners who have their their marriage has completely fallen apart. You know, once the business got going, all of these other things started happening. And so I, I love having this discussion because it does educate those who, you know, may think I am alone. You know, I, I don't know what the next move is. So with that being said, Shelly, let the studio audience know how they can reach out to you. Um, if they're looking for a consultation, if they're looking for, you know what, I, I wanna know more about her story, where can they find you online and how can they get it one-on-one -on -one with you? Sure, so my company is called Geostar Chicago and it's the website is G-I-O-S-T-A-R Chicago. That's geostarchicago.com. And we're a regenerative medicine company. So we help patients with degenerative conditions like arthritis, Crohn's, uh, lung disease, things like that. Um, and then personally, you can find out more about my story and my book as well, upcoming book at ShellySue.com, S-H-E-L-L-Y-S-O-O-D.com, or you can listen to our podcast at the ShellyStory.com. I love it. And you definitely got to have you back on when the book comes out. So that way we can go ahead and promote that as well. Speakeasy podcast listeners, y'all, let me know how this episode resonated with you. Leave me a review on your favorite podcasting platform. Share it out. If you need to press pause, take some notes, go back, rewind and listen again, because this is all about you being able to elevate in life and in business. With that being said, I'm your host, Alice Louise Pelzer. And until next time, don't forget, to press it out. See ya.